every movie needs a hook, something that sets the tone for the whole movie. And this could be anything, ranging from a mysterious crime scene in The Usual Suspects or a perfectly intricate heist in The Dark Knight. And generally speaking, the hook is indeed the opening scene of a movie, where you show something to an audience who aren't warmed up to the occasion, and therefore they're always a few steps behind the story. But sometimes the scene that hooks you to the story goes beyond the opening scene, such as in the movie Interstellar, where the hook of the movie comes in at around the 19th minute, when you see Cooper running into the room to find a strange gravitational anomaly. These are the type of incidents that intrigues the audience and opens the door to the story itself. And this scene could be used to introduce a hero, or a villain, or the plot, or even a fantasy world in which the entire story is likely to take place. But generally speaking, this scene should establish how the story will evolve. In other words, it should set the pace for the whole movie. And for a sequel like Puss in Boots The Last Wish, you don't have to reintroduce the hero, for we all know who he is. But what you can do is re-establish who he is. And that's exactly why the opening scene of the movie kinda starts in the middle of a celebration. The scene is very jovial and colorful, suggesting a continuation of the theme of the prequel. And perhaps this gives us an expectation of what's to come. But only that something unexpected happens. I call this one, the legend will never die! <laughs> You see, this opening scene was a mere extension of the first movie. A bit of diversion to make you walk down a blind alley. The actual movie begins here, when Puss in Boots wakes up at the doctor's place. Now this scene changes the direction of the movie, as it talks about deeper topics such as death, and we slowly see a touch of tension creeping into the movie. But that was purposefully done, for this scene was a mere introduction, to plant an idea in your head that this movie is not gonna be like its prequel. But it's still not the hook of the movie though, for all this scene does is lay the groundwork for the actual hook of the movie. And in my opinion, what comes next is the perfect scene from Puss in Boots' The Last Wish. Right before Puss in Boots leaves the doctor's clinic, the doctor tells him this. And remember Boots, death comes for us all. Now this was a bit of subtle foreshadowing for the scene that comes after. The scene from the tavern. The tavern scene starts with the bartender sliding a glass of cream in the direction of an annoyed Puss in Boots. The idea of retirement is something that he finds comical, and the suggestion from the doctor to be a house cat for the rest of his life doesn't sit with him really well. And as he sips away his drink, there is denial in his words, perhaps due to an inner monologue that's happening in his head. And as this happens, the camera angle changes. And although there aren't any cameras being used here technically, the perspective shift in animation is also used for similar purposes, which is to convey meaning. And as the perspective changes here, the shot becomes wider, and Puss in Boots is seen with his back turned against us, in a much wider shot than the one before, drastically reducing the importance of him in this shot. And if you paid attention, you'd find that this is the first shot in the movie where Puss in Boots isn't facing you. And this was quite deliberate, because this reduces him from a legend to just another character in a tavern. Before this, his personality stood out in every scene, but now he's portrayed as just another cat blending into the ambience of the tavern. And as he orders another glass of cream, the perspective shifts once again. As the bartender leaves the shot, the tavern slowly turns quiet. And in the context of Puss in Boots movies, or even children's movies in general, silence is hardly used for emphasis, because people find it a bit uneasy, especially in western animation. And again, not saying that it doesn't happen, but just that it is quite rare. Now what if I told you that this specific shot is the most important shot in all the movie? In this new perspective, we see Puss in Boots from above. And this is what you call stripping away power from someone. It is literally equivalent to the phrase looking down on someone, which implies that there is a transfer of power. In the opening scene of the movie, Puss in Boots is almost centered in every shot, making him the main subject, and there are more shots where the perspective makes us look up to him, almost in a sense of admiration for the legend that is Puss in Boots. But that shot turns upside down here. In this shot, Puss in Boots is hardly a legend. This perspective takes that power away from him. But the erasure of power is just the beginning here, as this scene delves deeper into the idea planted by the movie right before this scene. Death. Comes for us all. 
Okay, now this might just be a subtle theory, but just notice how the chandelier or this candle holder has four visible candles. But the chandelier is only half visible here, meaning in the other half there must be four more candles. And sure enough, that's proven to be true in one of the later shots. Two candles per each quadrant, adding up to eight candles, out of which one is still burning. And call me crazy, but I think this was a reference to the eight lives that Puss in Boots had lost. He had been exhausting his nine lives carelessly to keep the legend of Puss in Boots alive. But such recklessness doesn't concede without consequences. And in this pensive ambience, when the final candle goes out, this was actually death catching up to him. And even in this shot, we don't actually get to see the real Puss in Boots. It's a reflection that we see of him. And you can't help but think there's still a sense of denial in his words. <laughs> Retire. And even his face portrays an element of contrived bravery. But nevertheless, as soon as he looks away to sip his drink, you hear this whistle. If the candle going out was subtle, this mirror makes it obvious. When Puss in Boots looks in the mirror, what he's watching here is a reflection of him next to a cloaked hooded figure, the incarnation of the very thing he'd been dismissing. Death in this very shot has caught up to him. And when the perspective changes, it is confirmed that he wasn't just seeing things in the mirror. Death was right beside him. The arrival of the cloaked white wolf is quite symbolic of death. Sometimes death comes to you when you least expect it. And this is why I really appreciated this scene, because it got an honest reaction from the protagonist, someone who's quite oblivious to who he's dealing with. And everything that death says from here forward is quite methodical and mysterious. Almost like he's toying with Puss in Boots, who's already been quite pensive about death. And in every passing shot, you can see Puss in Boots trying to overcome this most instinctive fear which he had never felt before. But little does he know that this fear had taken shape in the form of the very cloaked figure who he's talking to. I couldn't help but notice how calm and calculated death is in this scene. He knows that Puss in Boots doesn't know who he is. Everyone thinks you'll be the one to defeat me. But no one's escaped me yet. And therefore, he gets a chance to measure the true caliber of the legend that is Puss in Boots. But of course, Puss in Boots takes the bait, and although he tries to overcome this newly gained fear of death, even if it was momentarily, all the shots that led to this scene showed us a shift in power. The legend of Puss in Boots was slowly but surely withering away. And Puss in Boots tries to put up one last fight, but the white wolf evades his doubtful attacks with calm precision. And in the next shot, just notice how Puss in Boots does the same spinning move that he pulled off in the opening scene. But this time the wolf catches him in mid-flight. And this is where the actual power shift is completed. And the legend of Puss in Boots officially dies. And in every shot that follows this, you can see how Puss in Boots is defending for his life. And the more he does this, the more the wolf grows stronger. Even in stature, as shots such as this emphasize that very fact. The wolf is unimaginably formidable. The thing that's unfolding in front of our eyes is the deconstruction of a legendary character that was built up over several different stories. And on this fateful night, inside a gloomy tavern, in one perfect scene, the legend of Puss in Boots is dismantled by a white wolf cloaked in black. And slowly but surely, he comes to grips with the fact that he is no match for this adversary. And right before the wolf lands his final blow, the screen turns completely red, symbolizing tension and danger. One of the twin sickles grazes Puss in Boots in the forehead. And that's when you see the true identity of the cloaked wolf. That's when you see the Grim Reaper. And if everything Puss in Boots felt before this point was concerned, in this one shot with blood streaming down his forehead, what you see in his eyes is not just mere concern, but it is a genuine fear of death. And in his eyes, we see the very thing that inflicted this fear. And this is truly where the villain announces himself as death. And perhaps the point where Puss in Boots fears this entity more than anything that he has ever feared in his life. Although he doesn't quite understand what the true identity of the wolf is. But nevertheless, the next few shots confirm the harsh reality of the protagonist. As Puss in Boots lays on the ground, defeated. The fur on the back of his neck stands up, which is a common reaction to fear found in most creatures. 
And this is what I really loved about this scene. The way they stripped away the legacy of Puss in Boots to make him look like just another ordinary cat that you'd come across in the natural world. There's an element of realism here which is not very commonly seen in animation. And when Puss in Boots fears death, we understand this fear for we have experienced it in some way, shape or form. The next shot reveals that the wolf is fully in control of the situation as he relishes the moment, methodically taking his own time to haunt a helpless protagonist. Even if this scene ended here abruptly, we'd still know that the villain isn't here for comical reasons. He is on a mission to take what Puss in Boots had been squandering all his life. But the scene doesn't stop here. It actually goes much much deeper than any children's movie should. And when we see this helpless version of Puss in Boots, devoid of all honor and glory, once a great hero stripped to being just a scared cat in an unknown tavern, we feel for him and at the same time we fear for ourselves because of the very concept of the movie. And as he stares at this ominous entity, walking towards him with twin sickles, his life flashes before his eyes and his heart starts to beat faster. And as an anxious person myself, this is kinda how anxiety works in real life. It almost makes the world around you go slower. And in this shot, Puss in Boots is trying to process his predicament as the wolf orders him to pick up his sword and fight like the legend he is. But that legend was long gone before this shot. And what's left of him here is a cowardly cat praying for mercy. But in a moment of desperation, Puss in Boots leaves his rapier behind and sprints out of the room like a startled cat. And this is quite symbolic of a hero's retirement. To leave your sword behind on the battlefield is to let go of that life, to quit and never look back. And this scene could have still ended here, but it doesn't. It goes on. And then we hear this dreaded whistle once again. And as Puss in Boots hides behind this door, he knows that this moment hasn't passed yet. And as he waits anxiously behind the door, his worries are confirmed as we see the silhouette of the wolf slowly approach Puss in Boots, the silhouette growing bigger and bigger by every footstep. Death is like a shadow. No matter where you run, no matter where you hide, it will always be behind you, waiting for the right moment. And this extra shot was precisely to show the persistence of death and to set the plot in motion. It foreshadows every interaction that Puss in Boots will have with death from here forward. And in the final shot of this scene, Puss in Boots has escaped death for now. But the chase is well and truly underway, which is confirmed by the wolf himself. Corre, corre, gatito. And you walk away from this scene wondering if you're just tuned in to a horror movie. And it introduces a villain so powerful that it makes you question. How does Puss in Boots beat this entity? And that was the whole point of this nearly 4 minute scene. In the opening scene, the story reminded us of the legend of Puss in Boots. The scene that came after planted an idea in our minds. A concept so universal. That death comes for us all. And in the third scene, it deconstructed the hero, stripping away his power and giving it to an all-powerful entity in the form of the white wolf. And in my opinion, this is the perfect scene from Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Because this not only changes who Puss in Boots is in this movie, but it sets him on a path to finding himself. This deconstruction of character was necessary to rebuild the legend of Puss in Boots from scratch. But this time not as a selfish and arrogant little hero, but rather as a hero that really cares for the people around him. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and maybe consider subscribing as well because that really helps quite a lot. And I also made another video about Puss in Boots The Last Wish. So if you want to check that out, you can check it out over here.